Welcome to the world today. I'm Vikas Majid Khan. Well, how can we talk about anything other than the rally which is underway? Mr. Nawaz Sharif is headed to Lahore. We'll talk about the political situation and the emerging uh, political situation, rather, in the country. Uh, to get the conversation started, first of all, I'd like to talk to our correspondent, Shabir Ahmed Vagra, and he'll give us the details of what is happening in that procession. Uh, thank you for joining us, Shabir. Uh, could you please give us an update, Shabi, regarding uh, what's happening in the procession right now, number of people that are a part of this uh, rally that is headed towards Lahore? Any other details that you can add? Yes, uh, the rally, which has uh, almost reached uh, Fazabad, the point from where it will uh, take a turn towards uh, Rawalpindi city, it will uh, go on Murray Road to, uh, to the Kacheri, which is a point where it is expected that uh, Nawashri will address the gathering as well. So, uh, according to different reports, there are a lot of people who have, uh, uh, who are the part of this uh, rally, and uh, there are also different people who are waiting at different points. Uh, for example, there are a lot of people who are waiting for the rally at uh, Fazabad to join it uh, on uh, to, till further on Murray Road, and there are a lot of people on different points, uh, which are uh, different local leaders uh, from Rawalpindi. They have their own gathering, and they are waiting uh, at different points, like uh, Chani Chowk. Uh, different people are also waiting for uh, the rally at other different points of Rawalpindi city, they will also join. And uh, so far, there are a lot of people. Uh, there are, uh, there are uh, thousands of uh, like vehicles which are accompanying this uh, rally. And uh, there is uh, uh, more than like uh, there are different figures which are coming. We, we cannot say exact figures, but there are many more people than what uh, are expected. That they are part of the rally right now. And uh, uh, we can expect that once it will reach uh, at Mariuchok, uh, where uh, it is expected that uh, Nawashri will address, uh, uh, that would be the first address to the people who are participating in rally. There, there would be a lot, lot, lot more people than right now, which are the part of this rally. All right, Shabir, uh, what, how long is this uh, entire rally expected to last? We had uh, information that it would uh, probably last a day or two, uh, but there are also speculation rife that this might go on for uh, more than three or four days. Do you think that uh, seems to be the case when you see the number of people that are swelling onto the streets, or is that not the case, in your opinion? Uh, yes, Vakas, you rightly pointed out that it is initially with the plan which uh, PMLN has given that was uh, for a two days long rally. But uh, as much as uh, the uh, ground realities are concerned. Uh, th it started at 12 p.m. today, and uh, right now, after almost five hours, uh, still it has just covered few kilometers. It has just reached Fazabad, and there's a lot of uh, area which needs to be covered to reach uh, uh, even the first uh, uh, standpoint, like uh, Mariuchok, where Nawashrif has to address. So that uh, it looks like that it will take more than three or four days uh, at, at this pace, and if we can expect that uh, at uh, GT Road, it, it it can gain a little more speed then even then it is uh, looking uh, not possible that this will end in two days at least uh, uh, we can expect that uh, it will take three days all right uh, Shabir tell us about the arrangements that have been made for the Prime Minister's address uh, uh, how exactly has the stage been set up and what are the details over there there are two different arrangements, uh, uh, like uh, there, there is a stage over there, and also, as you know, the, there is a container as well. So it depends upon the security clearance, the weather uh, Noashri will address from the stage, because uh, there is a stage as, which has uh, also been arranged at uh, uh, the Marie Chowk as well, and then the further address, which would be in Jhelum. Th that is for sure that that would be an open stage that has been uh, arranged at Jhelum as well. There, uh, Noashri will also to address the gathering today. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of security arrangements which also have been done. Uh, more than 25 uh, security personnel have been deployed, especially there are people without uniform also performing duty to ensure the foolproof security. And according to reports uh, from secu security agencies, there would be a one helicopter which will accompany this rally for aerial surveillance as well. And uh, elite force commandos, uh, will, they will also perform the duties. So um, Punjab uh, law minister, uh, uh, Ranas Naula is uh, already there at in the Pindi to check the security arrangement, especially at uh, the first standing point uh, where Nawaz Sharif has to address the rally. And uh, uh, according to reports, uh, uh, Federal Interior Minister Asan Iqbal also accompany uh, the rally towards uh, till Fazabad, especially he was at the forefront so that he can uh, check the security arrangements and uh, to, to ensure the foolproof security to uh, rally as well. 
And Shabir, you mentioned that uh, the first address of the rally will take place in uh, Rawalpindi. How long do you think it's going to take the Prime Minister, or rather the ex-Prime Minister, to reach that point? Uh, Vakas, as much as uh, we can uh, like judge from the um, distance covered so far, uh, we can be uh, like uh, expect that uh, uh, at night, uh, like uh, around about 10 o'clock, uh, we can expect that this rally can reach the point uh, at uh, where uh, Nawaz Sharif is expected to address the rally because uh, uh, the distance it covered so far it is uh, uh, less than the distance it has to cover to reach that point. And uh, the Islamabad roads are more wider than the uh, Pindi road. So Murray road is a uh, little bit of congested than that. So we can expect that even rally will, uh, will be more slower in, inside the Rawal Pindi more uh, like uh, than uh, Islamabad. All right, Shabir, thank you very much for that update. We will keep in touch with you for further updates uh, as the rally progresses forward. Thank you very much. Now, coming back to the studio, I'd like to introduce my guests. Joining me today for this discussion, we have Shahzad Raza. He is a journalist and also a colleague of mine in PTV. Along with him, we have Javed Rana Saab, who is also a journalist. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here. Shahzad, I'll start with you. Uh, first of all, wh what do you think is the significance of this rally being taken out uh, at this point in time, right after the Prime Minister was sent home? Uh, what does it all mean? Um, you have to go back to the day when uh, former Prime Minister appeared before the joint investigating team. And after he came out uh, from the meeting and he addressed the media, in which he categorically stated that this is the JIT, this is the court, and I'm going to be, you know, uh, uh, we will uh, present, uh, ourselves present, present, present myself, I've already presented myself uh, before the law. But there is another JIT, the JIT of the people, and there is another court, court of, he was referring to Allah Almighty. So now when uh, everything has gone against him, the decision and, you know, uh, before the decision, uh, the political engagement of the people, the PTI has captured the attention of the media and people across the country. So now this is the time that he uh, really wants to show that I'm still the popular leader. And, um, and because uh, there is a no remedy available at the moment until unless he files the review petition and the judges they might uh, reconsider their uh, opinion their judgment which is very very unlikely in the cases like these so uh, basically uh, he still trying to prove that he's the most popular leader regardless of uh, whether he is in the office or outside the office and uh, what i feel is basically this is uh, something um, uh, the beginning of the electoral campaign although we know that elections are one year away, right. but still he will build the momentum. Uh, he will try to um, convince the people that whatever decision the Supreme Court of Pakistan has taken against him was uh, not acceptable to him, although uh, he uh, abide by the, that decision and he you know, resigned. But at the same time, his party is so much popular, and next time, when the time comes of the election, uh, the people should come and vote for him. And, and it's a message for the opposition as well. It's a good politics, I believe, because this is probably the first time in many, many years that PMLN is getting such sort of attention in the mainstream media. Right. That uh, f uh, forte before that was with the PTI. You see, so What do you think about the now. number of people that have been... Uh, it's irrelevant, I believe. I believe it's irrelevant at the moment because in Islamabad, you know the culture of Islamabad. People, they are relaxed, laid back, sitting on the TV channels and watching, having fun. But, uh, and Islamabad is not the place for such jalsas. You know, big and wide roads, even thousands of people, you really cannot show that it's a very successful sort right. of a rally. Right. But when it goes to Rawalpindi, the congested roads, the Murray Road, you know, the thickly populated areas, the people would come out, of course, uh, the supporters and the bystanders, you know, the tamash bean, we call it in Urdu. Right. So uh, you will show the real strength of PMLN is Punjab, starting from Pindi to Lahore. Right. So that would be the real test case for them, the Murray Road and then GT Road. All right. Uh, Rana Saab, let's talk about the uh, options available to the ex-Prime Minister when it comes to the Supreme Court. Uh, they, we have heard that they want to go into a review petition and the, the other uh, caveat with the review petition is that they would uh, also request for a larger bench or a full bench. So do you think there are any uh, precedents for that happening previously or what are the chances that a new bench would be constituted to hear the review petition? Well, there are precedents uh, in the past, but then the situation was altogether different. I mean, Pakistan was under military dictatorship. 
the judges had taken an oath of personal allegiance to a military dictator, and then those judges had uh, handed down a ruling which was controversial. Uh, we don't face that situation now. It is altogether a different situation. Almost nine years was we have seen this court proceedings and then the investigation by a joint investigation team. Uh, and then the five judges have heard uh, all parties uh, in a manner, I think that leaves no doubt in the minds of at least independent legal experts that whatever we have seen in form of the ouster of the uh, former prime minister, legally speaking, it makes a lot of sense. Now, we just have seen uh, the first phase of the litigation. And if, if we just categorize it, five judges, Three judges just uh, picked up one confession of the ex-premier that he had an offshore asset. We are not going to get into the details of what does it mean by the assets. And the two judges found the evidence of his London properties, and then they relied upon the public interviews of uh, uh, ex-prime minister's wife, his children, and said there are contradictions, so uh, he has lied to the nation. We disqualify him. Now, important point is, what is going to happen in the second phase of the litigation? In the National Accountability Bureau, uh, the major part of the evidence is going to be produced before the court. And I find that will be very harder uh, for the uh, ruling uh, members of uh, uh, Sharif family to defend them. Reason being is uh, that they have come up with an evidence which clearly shows the original evidence uh, that the properties in London belong to Marim Nawaz. Uh, something early on they denied in the court because they said, it's, look, this is not, this is unsigned copy, uh, this is a photocopy, that's not acceptable. Oh, there was a trust that was formed or something like that. And, uh, and then, the, uh, I'm coming to that point, because in, uh, the documents shows, original documents shows, and the original allegations and petition also suggest that the, uh, the property was purchased in early 90s. The stance of the Hassan Nawaz, who said it belongs to me, uh, that he purchased it in 2006, and there was a trust deal between both brother and sister. And according to a GI investigation, that trust deed is a forged document. And we have a lot of controversy about that, how that document was created. Now, the Supreme, what Supreme Court has done, Supreme Court, in fact, did not go into the forged charges. Though uh, under the law they could have done it, they said let the NAP court do it. In fact, the court has given an option to the ruling party that even now, if they, have if they can come up with a genuine evidence which can establish their case that the properties were purchased in 2006 and not in early 90s, they still have a chance, which I don't think is going to happen. Now, the ruling family cannot create more documents. They cannot uh, forge more documents because if they do that, if they come up with another evidence, that means the, f the initial evidence which they already produced before GIT and the Supreme Court, it would contradict them. So that means more forgery. So they are in a web of their own contradiction and I don't expect this case would take more time. Now it appears the NAB is probably waiting more evidence to come to uh, that may be altogether new evidence under mutual assistant law uh, arrangements, uh, they are expecting more evidence to come. And uh, within a couple of, next couple of weeks, this uh, proceeding is going to take place. And the rally that uh, the ex-Prime Minister has undertaken, in fact, uh, he wants to uh, send a signal to the state institutions that he still enjoys public support. I was in the rally just uh, an hour ago my understanding of the situation is that the traditional sport base of the ex-Prime Minister is still intact. And when I talk of traditional sport base, that means the activists of the ruling party. Uh, they love their leaders, uh, they don't go into the nitty gritties of the law, but if you talk of common people, uh, they are indifferent to the situation. And uh, public opinion is divided largely on party lines. Right. I mean, the common people are not getting into the uh, nitty-gritty details of the law. Uh, they, if somebody is supporter of, uh, of ex-prime minister, they are going to vote for him. But he's not going to get two-third majority. Uh, he's not going to get a kind of response from the public the way Benzir Bhutto had in, in 1984, or for that matter, Imran Khan had in 2011, 
situation is very different because for that kind of sport you need a moral authority. Uh, that I see is unfortunately is missing and particularly after the Supreme Court judgment, uh, people uh, have a different view uh, about the ex-Prime Minister because one thing is clear that there is something seriously wrong. Now, uh, there have been a response from the uh, ex-Prime Minister. He said there is no allegation of corruption <coughs> against him. In the, under the lab, NAB law, quote unquote, it corrupt, corruption and corrupt practices. Money laundering is dealt as a corruption and corrupt practices. The allegation uh, against him is that the money was illegally transferred from Pakistan and this entire chain of offshore business and the steel mills were built. And then the GIT finding said that the, all those offshore companies and the steel mills, they were in, in losses. And then the uh, ex-premier is sending money in the account of his, his own son. And his son is now sen then sending money back to the prime minister in Pakistan. Uh, that clearly shows all that right, right. while uh, sustaining money laundering. I think we will that later. Uh, right now we're being joined by our uh, senior controller news, Mr. Asmatullah Khan Yazi. Thank you for joining us, sir. Uh, sir, what do you foresee as the political future of the PMLN? We know that the Prime Minister has been deposed and is on his way back to Lahore. What do you see in the future of the PMLN, sir? We see it's a political party. Yeah, it has a, uh, now it's, it's uh, now about uh, over 33 years. It's very difficult to, uh, to destroy, damage, uh, or, uh, or uh, eliminate from, from, from the political scene. Uh, uh, I think uh, there may be change, uh, change, uh, change of pace. Uh, there may be change of uh, uh, the people on the, uh, on uh, on the helm of affairs. But you see, it's very difficult to eliminate political parties from the scene. Uh, uh, as you know, that uh, uh, establishment uh, earlier have tried to eliminate the Pakistan People's Party. Divide, uh, try, they, they, they tried to divide the, uh, Pakistan People's Party. They created many factions of uh, Pakistan. sort of a future do you foresee for Mr. Nawaz Sharif personally, sir? I think uh, um, I heard earlier, and there have been reports, and there have been uh, of, uh, of, uh, discussion, and they, they announced uh, uh, in, in uh, various uh, press, uh, 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 press, uh, press conferences that they will take the legal course, they will challenge, they will not accept the judgment of uh, uh, Supreme Court of Pakistan, I, but, but still they they have not filed any petition, they, but, but for me, I think they must file. They must uh, fight legally. They must fight uh, uh, if there is any any hope. Uh, uh, if they want to uh, go to the people in uh, in, uh, uh, in 2018 uh, without the baggage of this judgment, I think without uh, with this baggage that there would be uh, difficulties. They, they may face difficulties, uh, but if they go without the baggage of uh, this judgment. It would be easier to be re-elected and have an edge of uh, on over uh, other parties. Uh, otherwise, I think there may be a uh, very difficult situation. Well, thank you very much, Yaisa, for taking all the time and talking to us. Uh, coming back to the studio, uh, Shazad, uh, one thing that Yazisa mentioned was that uh, uh, there might be a re-election in the future of Mr. Nawaz Sharif. But as we understand it, according to the judgment, he has been disqualified for life. So, how re-election in which capacity? Re-election in which capacity? 
like, well, he, he's he's Richard, no, like Richard, like he's even he's, he's even been asked to uh, remove himself as party head and appoint somebody else. So, what kind of a political future would there remain for Mr. Nawaz Sharif? Is the real question when he has been disqualified from even holding party office? So, uh, that's what Niyazi no, Sahib was I, talking about. I fail to understand what exactly Niyazi Sahib was mentioning about the elections because under the law at the moment he cannot contest the elections until and unless the bar. Uh, placed by the Supreme Court of Pakistan on him exactly. is removed. And um, uh, if you remember, after 1999 military coup and the judgment and the punishment given to Mr. Nawaz Sharif, uh, he was disqualified to be member of the parliament for at least 21 years, if I'm correct me if I'm not wrong. And But that was something different. He was given uh, the remedy from the court of law later on upon his return. Right. Uh, but right now, uh, the ethics court, the highest court in, in the country, that has given the decision against him. So the only remedy, I, I'm no, no law expert, but he has is the review petition. Uh, the chances of its success are very, very, very remote. Yeah. Uh, the, on the other hand, some constitutional experts, they say that uh, he might contest the election provided some constitutional amendment is made specifically on that, uh, that, that uh, uh, issue or to identify the time period of a disqualification. For example, if you disqualify a person, on charges of, let's say, uh, that uh, he concealed his wealth or asset, which has to be had to be declared in his nomination paper. So there has to be a limit on the disqualification. You cannot disqualify a politician for a lifetime. Uh, take the example of Yusuf Azagilani. He was uh, he was convicted uh, on the basis of contempt of court because he refused to write a letter uh, against. Uh, then President Zadari, right. uh, he was given the punishment till the rising of the court and then there was a disqualification for five years. In fact, the Article 63 of the Constitution that defines the time limit of uh, the disqualification, but that was different, that is the different uh, circumstances in, right. in case the question of disqualification arises. But in this case, even the Attorney General of Pakistan, he categorically stated that disqualified for life. But there is one uh, case specifically on the tenure of disqualification is pending before the Supreme Court of Pakistan. It might give us some answers to give clarity to the situation provided the judgment comes in this case. Well, it's a very uh, tricky uh, position that um, Mia Nawaz Sharif now finds himself in because as you have also admitted that he is a popular leader and he enjoys the love of his uh, followers, uh, PMLN supporters and everything. So uh, how would it play out for his political career? Do you think his political career is effectively finished as of now? Or do you think there still is some life left in it? Well, I never said that he's a popular leader. What I've said is that he still retain his public support. Uh, the public support in the sense that he's a traditional vote bank. And I myself have seen that the people who are participating in the rally, they are his diehard supporters. Uh, for them, it doesn't matter if a court has disqualified him on whatever charges. Uh, I think uh, the, uh, it really depends in what manner and how soon the trial is conducted in the accountability court. Because there you f would find the hard evidence. Right. There you f would find the evidence of corruption. Uh, there you would find the evidence on how money was illegally transferred from Pakistan to abroad. And there you would find uh, how the offshore business was uh, uh, built up. And there you find how the money was being channeled uh, from one uh, account to another account, and how all these companies, all these offshore, uh, of these steel mills, uh, they were in bad health. And nonetheless, the money was being legalized, being whitened uh, through legal means, at, uh, and that was directly being transferred to uh, ex-Prime Minister's account. I think that is going to change the public opinion. And that is going to be a determining factor in what manner uh, the, uh, the future of the, uh, this ruling party would be. Because you see, now uh, the ex-Prime Minister has been knocked down primarily on technical grounds uh, about the misdeclaration right. of his assets. But the court, had court found, though I, I, I know that there was clearly an evidence which indicates that uh, there was clear uh, contradiction of the Prime Minister of what he said in the Parliament and then the evidence with which they, the entire family came up with about the ownership of the properties. But the three judges decided not to touch it because had they done that, I think there would have been legal problem and those problem would be that an accused cannot be charged uh, twice on the same charge sheet. Right. So the NAB court could not have tried him and that is the core of the evidence.
Right. They, therefore, I think uh, that evidence is going to be revealed uh, during the co course of trial. And we will hear these private medias and then the a lot of propaganda line by the, by the opposition parties, by the lawyers. I think that is going to have an impact on building a public perception because at least the traditional vote bank of the prime minister is still intact. They are not ready to believe in that because he has been knocked down tech on technical grounds. And when they will see that uh, something on merit has happened, the ex-premier was engaged in money laundering and it is a corruption. I think there is a swing voters. Right. They are going to uh, change. And now, which is the next party? That is still a questionable because, unfortunately, we don't have an ideal situation in Pakistan where political, one political party is uh, have, have any, uh, having any moral ground. So there are problems with also with the opposition parties right. on moral issues. And then with the, this ruling party, we have a f uh, problems with our financial corruption. So I think uh, the in coming uh, weeks and months, the situation would be far more clear, and I don't expect that this time around. You think it will be clear, or th you think it will be getting even more muddy and interesting? Because, uh, as you mentioned, you know there's immorality flying all around in all the political parties that you mentioned. Moving on, Shazad, uh, in, in your that opinion, that is a topic I would not uh, <laughs> like to speak on. Let's not <laughs> discuss that yet. Uh, Shazad, uh, what do you see as the future of the PMLN? Because uh, we know that the Prime Minister is showing his uh, his support base. Uh, First of all, uh, do you think it's, uh, it's, who is he trying to send this, this message clearly to, first of all? And secondly, what sort of a future do you foresee for the PMLN? Uh, yesterday, we had a meeting with the ex-Prime Minister, and we asked uh, this question that uh, he's conducting a rally and uh, shouldn't be taken as a direct message to uh, some of the powerful institutions in the country because uh, we heard from uh, many of his uh, companions that there was a grand conspiracy against the government, specifically against the Prime Minister. So when we asked him to identify the conspirators and the people who were hatching conspiracies against him, so uh, he was kind of a diplomatic and said, well, uh, I, uh, the people should get these answer. And he, in fact, uh, proposed a grand debate uh, among the public sphere to identify the problems and uh, the, the loopholes in the system. In fact, uh, I believe that Prime Minister was uh, uh, trying to avoid the clash of institutions. And uh, we know in the past, the history of Pakistan is replete with examples that from where the conspiracies uh, were, uh, were being hashed. But now, uh, the, the core purpose of this all exercise is to keep the vote, uh, uh, vote base intact, number one. And I slightly, uh, with due respect, uh, differ with Mr. Javed Wana that he's not a popular leader. Uh, there's, uh, it is all about how you define the popularity. General Musharraf claimed that he was a popular leader because he had three million followers on the Facebook. Imran Khan claims that he's a popular leader because every time he addresses a rally, thousands of people, they show up. And, you know, there are young crowd and so-called uh, very energetic and youthful voices. Uh, but politics in Pakistan, especially in Punjab, uh, it uh, and that is the uh, the uh, answers to your second part of your question the, the future of PMLN uh, basically uh, it relies on the very complicated and complex uh, system of brotheries electables the people the panchayat the village at that level right so uh, even if uh, for instance in uh, Mandi Bahauddin was he Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif is not that popular just giving you an example but the local MNA uh, would be carrying that weight. He is the person who is holding the fort for him. And on the larger landscape, the ex-prime minister, he is the leader. He is the identity of the party. And even if he's not uh, the president of the Pakistan Muslim League, Nawaz, doesn't matter. He can be the patron and Qaeda as he used to be after 99 military coup. The Shabazz Sharif can run the show on the technical, on the legal grounds. But on the back uh, hand, the prime minister... He would still be uh, calling the still shots. Be. But the point is, uh, the politics of Punjab, it does matter, and it only matters in, uh, and it holds the key to the success, to the parliament, to the government. They have the electables. The only dilemma uh, the opposition parties are facing at the moment, they don't have uh, the real candidates, a large number of, a good number of candidates they, though, who can fight against the PMLN uh, you know, nominees in the next election. And that is the plus point for the ruling party. 
because they are trying to keep Punjab intact in their hand. And that's why they took the decision that Shabaz Sharif should not be uh, coming to Islamabad as right. a prime minister and he should uh, work as a chief minister, you know, supervise all the election activities and deliver something to the people no matter how. Right. Ransa, uh, moving forward, uh, uh, what do you expect uh, the, the outcome for the uh, next elections to be? Do you think that the PMLN will be able to have the kind of majority that they had in the previous elections? Or do you think that uh, the Panama case has actually affected the PMLN uh, perception in the masses and that it is going to take a beating because of that? I think, uh, in, if you uh, generally speaking, uh, the younger lot is with the Milan Khan, by and large. And the, uh, then the mature people, the middle-aged people, you will find them that generally they prefer to support with the Noon League. Uh, what is going to happen in the next elections, surely one thing seems to be clear. Uh, there were allegations of uh, riggings uh, whenever uh, uh, the former prime minister won election in the past. And I remember in 1997, three months before I had reported that the plan had been hashed to bring Nawashi with the two-third majority. It is on the rec record. And then there were similar allegations in the 90s. It, this does not mean that he doesn't, does, not, does not enjoy a majority. He has a sizable support in Punjab. And he can still come make, stage a comeback. Well, let's talk but about the rally. Let's talk about uh, the rally. Do you, uh, think, do you think that this particular rally is also part of the uh, electioneering that most political parties seem to be now going into election mode because, you know, the elections are not that far away now? Do you think that this is a major part of uh, Prime Minister's and the PMLN's uh, tactic in, in, in ensuring their uh, visibility and ensuring their vote bank stays intact? I think this is obviously a, he is in, ele in an election mode, but at the same time... But he doesn't have... We don't know that, whether he'll be allowed to uh, stand in the elections. The, 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 he would not be allowed to stand in the election, but at the same time his party can, uh, can still come back. Right. The point, so you think the, this the is more an exercise the, the, to, to you, strengthen you see, the party? There are many ifs and buts. Ifs and buts, how soon the trial of accountability is going to begin and how soon it would end. Before election, if it happens before the election, then these elect, elected bill that Shahzad was referring about, now their method is because what they are known to be as a migratory birds, they want to stay with the ruling party because they need funds. They have to undertake development in their respective constituencies. But three or four months before the elections, and if they find that the, uh, the ruling party's members, uh, the, the prime minister, ex-prime minister has been convicted on corruption charges, the public perception is going against him, certainly they are going to uh, shift their loyalties to Imran Khan because that unfortunately fortunately has been the trend. But at the same time, in the urban uh, areas, uh, you will find in every home now that is that stands divided. The, the teenagers, uh, they are with Imran Khan and the, <laughs> and the middle-aged people, they are with, with the new league. So that perception is going to matter in coming months and depends in, how, in what manner this entire uh, accountability trial is conducted. But one thing is clear, that there cannot be a propaganda on something which doesn't exist. It is inconceivable that the Supreme Court disqualified a prime minister on baseless charges. That is not acceptable. If you talk to the at least uh, educated people, they understand all these kind of things. But again, the politics of the electable is the most important factor now. And if these electable uh, sh shift their loyalties uh, to Imran Khan, I think he would win the election. And if the ruling party, as the ex-prime minister has now rightly taken a course, uh, at least to retain his support base. I mean, he may not, it, it, as it seems, draw a large number of people, but at least he is a sending message to his traditional uh, support base, to the ne his network of his party members, the activists, that he's still there, he's a victim. Now the trouble is that he's uh, finding difficulties to define who, uh, who, uh, at whose hand he was made victim. He's referring mutely uh, with the, to the military establishment, and then he's also referring about the Supreme Court. My understanding is that there is one thing that the ex-prime minister can do, and he has a very genuine reason for that. When he points out 
that why only me? Why there is a selective justice in Pakistan? Why there is a selective accountability in Pakistan? I think he has his very solid arguments. Why uh, the uh, former president, Asif Ali Zardari, was, his trial was not con concluded. And then there are the charge sheet against him. Uh, the scale is far bigger than him. But more importantly is the former military dictator, General Pervez Musharraf, the offender of the Constitution, who subverted the Constitution. He was indicted for uh, imposing martial law against the judiciary. And you might recall and read the 18th Amendment. If you go through that amendment, that means he is not even former president. His st legal stature of being a former president that he him calls himself is not there. Right, but his legal stature right now is that of an absconder, isn't it? it not only absconder, but also an ex-military dictator, ex-army chief who was sacked because all the legislation that he had made to give himself legal and constitutional cover, that was torn apart through 18 Amendment. Uh, and even his 1999 takeover is not illegal. There was a constitutional cover that was again torn apart through this, uh, this, this amendment. 18 Amendment. Now he was tried of his martial law against the judiciary in 2007. He was indicted. And then there was pressure from the military I think something which he should have resisted. And now he says it is a court which decided. I don't think that is the case. As a matter of fact, both court and the government was trying to escape, not to take the responsibility. In the court, the government said you can allow General Musharraf to leave Pakistan. And the court did not take an action on its own, as they did in this case, because there was a judgment of uh, the Supreme Court, la uh, larger bench, uh, where he was declared as a usurper. They, de they did not take any sumo to action. The point is those who are in the, who are mighty in Pakistan, uh, no one is ready to take them on. It is the political leadership simply don't take them on because uh, they have skeletons in their own cupboards. And Prime Minister at that point of time knew that he has it. So he did not resist and allow him to leave. And that is the most unfortunate aspect I think if you want a general accountability in Pakistan, if that means you will have to bring in that net former President Asif Zardari, uh, who is perceived to be thoroughly corrupt, and the, fo the former the military dictator, didn't, didn't General Pakistan. absolve him of all his uh, corruption cases? I thought he was declared uh, innocent in all the cases they were uh, He finished. was Isn't probably too innocent case? because uh, there, are, uh, there are fresh charges against him. Okay. On technical grounds, I mean, he had a secret deal with General Musharraf. And then the Swiss court was about to confirm his conviction just uh, two weeks away when all those cases were withdrawn. And then he actually destroyed all the evidence against him. But again, during the last three, four years, what they have done in the Sindh, I mean, they tried to smuggle out the money, the dollars, through launchers, <laughs> and tried to send them to the Dubai. And then I think there are a lot of work which has already been undertaken. But again, there is a perception that the political leadership uh, is being singled out. <coughs> uh, the, there, there has to be across the board accountability. And when you talk of the across the board accountability, and now the military chief also said that we believe in the supremacy of law and we will pursue it. I think the best next step should be that they should uh, ask General Musharraf to return and face the courts of law. Because you see, there are dozens, dozens of times he doesn't appear simply. He's an absconder. There are, there, it's not only... Uh, but what about the role of the media when they uh, call him up for every small thing that happens in the country, they want to have his opinion on what's going on in the country. Do you think that is also uh, legitimate? Unfortunately, the media has, uh, has, been, has divided itself on um, political lines. Uh, one particular group is taking an ultra-nationalistic approach, which sometimes uh, smacks of lacking rationality. The other group believes that you no, know, the all mess is caused by the military, so we should support the political establishment. I think the uh, the point is the media should stay as a media. They should they report should, and analyze in a right context. We should not take uh, positions and then make our judgments. And we think we can change the public perception. Gone are the days uh, when the media could have played that kind of role. Now it is a social media. And remember always, one thing is is very critically important. If you don't have anything to defend yourself, 
you cannot defend yourself with the force of the propaganda and that is what uh, no league try to try to uh, uh, try to do in the past and they have failed and if somebody try to uh, justify the escape of general Musharraf from pakistan on those grounds through media it is not going to work you go to the people ask them they will talk about it and i think this is very genuine reason there should not be a selective justice in pakistan every body should be held accountable no matter whosoever he may be whether they are in the military or in the political establishment and then unfortunately now there is also very uh, unfair propaganda against the military that they conspired against the, the political leadership i think they were under the court orders to find evidence against the prime minister and they came up with the evidence and that evidence makes sense it was not fabricated so they just did their job they simply did their job they did not test stage a coup right now prime minister said that it was already planned must have there are there were mis uh, mis but then i think we we are now uh, going into the realm of speculation let's come back out mm -hmm. of that and uh, uh, shahzad in your opinion all the political turmoil that we've witnessed in the past uh, couple of months uh, how do you think it is going to affect the long uh, the, the long run of democracy in pakistan how uh, beneficial do you think it's going to be to the democratic process for pakistan's democracy to get strengthened or continue for a long time to come do you think there's a chance of that happening do you think these events are have some silver lining to the dark cloud that we see uh, see uh, which democracy are we talking about right now because uh, almost 18 we have 18 elected prime minister since uh, we got the independence and all of them uh, their tenure ended prematurely none of them were allowed to uh, complete the tenure disqualified deposed murdered so on so uh, when we talk when we say that these events would have negative or positive impact on democracy uh, so i fail to understand exactly what we are trying to debate a lot of people are no, talking not, about baby I'm, steps you know that exactly, pakistan I, is taking in, i'm not in questioning the, your question i'm just you know trying to uh, understand what the people in general they are debating democracy would strengthen if uh, we start respecting the state institutions or we or the state institutions they start respecting each other's mandate so I mean, this is such a silly debate in my point of view because uh, uh, once you understand the dynamics, the contours of democracy, then you must understand that the parliament is the supreme institution. You really cannot uh, do anything which uh, undermines uh, the supremacy of parliament and that undermines the supremacy of the constitution. Uh, judiciary yes it's uh, one of the organs of the state but again the supremacy lies with the people of pakistan and they transferred that supremacy through the constitution to the parliament so once we understand this every institution starts working within the ambit of its own domain only then we can start this debate that well democracy is going to be strengthened or weakened because of these events and actions because as far as i'm concerned or i believe or whatever i witnessed during my brief professional career uh, you know the politicians it's very easy to criticize the politician it is very easy to say well rasif ali zardari is corrupt nawaz sharif is corrupt imran khan is morally corrupt it's very easy to say but do we have the courage to question the role of the state institution although there might be many many cases in the supreme judicial council of the honorable judges but do we have the courage you know to go there to identify to question well, well sir you have this case do we question the name of a certain number of uh, army officials or the judge in the panama paper well you just did did we did no, not we did thing. not do it we just did it right I mean, now i did it but uh, normally <laughs> well, the general not. debate it, it's not <laughs> absolutely it <laughs> never happened so it's uh, the easiest thing in the pakistan especially sitting on the camera is to criticize and abuse the politician that's it well i, I agree with you there but uh, we've been, we've been joined by our colleague farooq fatafi he's on the line with us as well let's get his views on these uh, latest developments uh, farooq you there with us yeah, how are you? Yeah, Farooq, uh, in your opinion, uh, what do you foresee as the future of uh, the PMLN and uh, also, uh, by extension, the future of democracy in Pakistan? Well, um, uh, by extension is an interesting question, but let me first uh, start by talking about PMLN. Uh, today's rally, uh, today's movement of Mianwashari from Islamabad to Lahore has actually shown 
uh, that uh, he is quite popular. He retains his uh, popularity and support. And uh, you, you realize that the support, uh, you know, the people who are joining the rally, uh, they are joining this caravan is increasing. It is snowballing. Uh, so in uh, one aspect, uh, we, we can be sure uh, that uh, he is uh, uh, retaining his support and gaining it as well. Uh, regarding the future of democracy, uh, yesterday and a day before yesterday, former Prime Minister actually said that he is ready and he will actually conduct or spearhead a grand national dialogue uh, um, on the future of democracy and the national interest. That is quite an interesting and important suggestion. But my, my concern is that when we are talking about democracy, usually we leave out the actors that have been uh, uh, playing an important part, but they are not part of politics per se. For example, state institutions. In the past, we, we know that out of 70 years, uh, for 35 years, we had dictatorship in the country. And then, of course, we talk about the prime ministers upon prime ministers who could not uh, complete their, uh, uh, you know, stint in office. These, these are important questions. And uh, how to actually engage all those institutions as well. This is important. But so many people are still uh, ignoring it. So we'll have to find a way. The second thing earlier, I was hearing one of uh, our colleagues sitting here and, uh, next to you about uh, the role of judiciary and the army and uh, who is going to question them. See, we are at a very delicate position here. On one side, of course, there are questions of democracy, there are questions of uh, stability and governance. On the other side, we have another problem that uh, there are non-state actors that keep on challenging the state institutions. And these institutions have been helping us regain semblance of stability. So we'll have to be very careful talking about them while trying to create uh, a narrative or a dialogue in which everybody is included. We have to be concerned that we don't, uh, you know, de destabilize the state or we don't weaken these institutions because they have played a very crucial role in fighting against that. Right. Well, thank you very much, uh, Farooq, for taking out the time and sharing your views with us. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank my guests in the studio. Thank you very much, Shazad. Thank you very much, Rana Saab. Uh, in conclusion, what we'd like to say is that whatever happens does happen for the benefit of Pakistan, and that is what we should all be focusing on. With that hope and on that note, it's goodbye. August day of Pakistan. Uh, be proud, 